Church, it's an honor to be with you today. Um, you're, you're, in good, you're in good shape. Like I said, I knew, I knew that would be a, a really powerful time uh, hearing from Rochelle. And so a typical, it's funny, a typical uh, sermon prep for me, I usually have about 34 pages that I work from. Today, I only have 18. And so that means we're going to eat relatively quick today. So, so um, it's an honor. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Today we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. If you have been with us over the the full course of our study to this point, mainly through chapter 1 as we finished last week, today we will see a great shift or a great pivot in Paul's letter. Uh, To this point, the Apostle Paul has given us a beautiful reminder of our fellowship, our inheritance, our identity that we have found in Christ. As we discussed last week, this comes to full reality in the body of Christ, which is his church. Remember, we cannot separate the church from Christ's body. They are one. I'm hopeful that this truth this week, hopefully you prayed about it, reflected on the idea of the church and, and her purpose. And it's transformed you more into his image this week. As we as a church who are knit together, just, just even for, for, our, for our brothers and sisters serving Ecuador, they are knit together with us for one purpose, and that's to glorify his name to the ends of the earth. So today at the beginning of Ephesians 2, is one of the more crucial portions, I really believe, of the, full, of the apostolic writings. Um, it deals with our true nature, our true sinful nature. In our text today, Paul explains human corruption or our depravity in a way that underscores more heavily than perhaps anywhere else in the New Testament, I believe. Our dependence on the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing us to life, more importantly, spiritual life. Our text today will also really come face to face with the real deception that is prevalent in our culture today concerning our will, or as some say, our free will. Man's ability to choose what is best for him has been a debate that has plagued the church for its entire history. And honestly, I'm not sure why. Paul is clear today about our state and our will, and I can assure you it's not free. To preface our text today, it's important for you to hear from me this. I love you. And because I love you, it's important that I dive deep into, honestly, what is a very uncomfortable conversation. This is the reason, honestly, that we teach expositionally. This is the reason that we cover every single verse and we don't leave any stone unturned. And that faces us today a really challenging text. I'm confident the Holy Spirit will minister us as we walk through this. But always remember there is hope. There is light in the darkness. With that being said, let's look at our text. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Let me pray for us. Holy Father, we praise you for the gift of your word. Father, when we come across such a challenging text, Lord, um, it just it gives us great confidence of your word. Lord, today we confirm, we, we proclaim as one body that your word is without error. And your word, as Jesus said, is that which sanctifies us. So today, Lord, I ask that you would sanctify us in the truth, the truth of your word, and that today, Lord, we would truly reflect on um, the true uh, depravity of our nature and respond with praise due to your grace. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. This opening statement is, is a classic description of the, of the natural person's condition because of the original sin of Adam. Paul addresses this statement to believers who once were in a state of spiritual death. It's important to notice that Paul uses the term dead. So important that we see that. Showing that the former spiritual state of these people was in fact lifeless. This is one of the areas that man-centered theology rears its ugly head. Sometimes we hear statements like this. Fallen man is so overcome by the power of sin that he is like a man on his deathbed. That he's extremely ill with no power to save himself. If he's going to be healed, he can't possibly do it through his own strength. The only way that he could be made well is for the doctor to give him medicine to restore him. The man is desperately ill. However, that he doesn't even have the power to reach out and take the medicine for himself. So the doctor approaches his bed, opens the bottle, pours the medicine in a spoon, and brings it to the dying man's lips. But at this point, he must still, by his own power, his own will and initiative, open his mouth to receive the medicine. There's also a prevalent analogy along these same lines that goes like this. There's a man out to sea, and he's drowning. And he's gone down three or four times. And the last time he goes down, they know that this will be his last time, that he will drown. But the argument is that if we throw him a life raft, he still has to be the one to reach and grab the life raft and be brought in, right? The problems with these analogies that are often used to defend our free will or in church history, the semi-Pelagian understanding of salvation. Honestly, these arguments do not hold weight of the word of God. And I understand that many of you may somewhere fall in the line of this as far as what you believe man's role is in salvation. This idea that man is still good enough to work his way into the kingdom of God through his own merits is just not found in the scriptures. And while all of us here would say it's only by grace, as if the medicine for the dying man, the argument is that there must be a cooperation between man's will and God's will for us to be saved. But the problem here with that understanding or that statement is this. Paul does not say that we were sick, does he? Paul does not say that we were sick in our trespasses and sin, does he? He doesn't say in our state that we are critically ill. He says we were dead. We were dead. 
we don't have the power to accept the medicine. Rather, the medicine must be injected into us because we are without life. With those conflicting ideas in view, let us look closely at what Paul says here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, you were dead, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul speaks of a fallen man's condition in terms of death. His point is to describe man's true spiritual state, not his biological state. And I think this is where sometimes the confusion lies. Obviously, when we come into the world, we're alive, right? We have minds that function. We have hearts that beat, wills that choose different things. You, in fact, chose this morning whether or not you would get your family up and you would come to church. We have affections. We have emotions. Yet because of the sin of Adam in the garden, we are spiritually dead. Or or better said, perhaps, dead to the things of God. He says, following the course of this world there in verse 2, we were conformed to this world. We were following the prince of the power of the air, which is a reference to the devil, which is a reference to Satan. This is where an important biblical teaching comes for us today. And the theological term that I want you to write down is the word regeneration. This is an important theological truth that we must understand. In order for us to be his church, in order for us to be his disciples, we must understand the biblical truth of regeneration. Regeneration is the truth that, or as Jesus said in John 3, that we would be born again, right? That's the idea of regeneration, is that we're made alive or that we're born again. Before regeneration, we were literally doing the bidding of, and living of Satan himself. Augustine once said, man is like a horse that has two riders, Either the horse is being ridden by Satan or he's being ridden by God. There is no in-between. Sadly, though, nothing is more natural for us than to adopt or embrace and walk according to the ways of this world, even when it is in direct contrast to the will of God. And church, for you, this is your daily fight. It truly is. This is your daily fight to fight against the cultural invasion into your mind. This is your distraction. Look at verse 3. Among whom we all once lived, the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul is not describing here this fallen condition as typical only or just the evil of society. He's not talking about those who live on the fray who we see openly practice sin and evil doing. He's speaking of all of of us. He is saying that this is the mode of behavior and lifestyle of everyone who has not been raised from a spiritual death or regenerated. As I said earlier, this is one of the most grim descriptions of our fallen human nature that we find in Scripture. And honestly, a really challenging one to preach on a day like today when we're eating soup and salad and hugging each other, right? But it's the will of of God. this description that Paul gives of our fallen nature. But if we're being honest, this idea or this picture that Paul gives here in in Ephesians 2, remember he's writing to a a body of believers in, in Ephesus. This conflicts greatly with our cultural view. If you're being super honest with yourself, this conflicts with it. Our culture, and perhaps even you say, 
None of us are perfect, but we're basically pretty good. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you said that or thought that? In fact, I believe that there's a popular country artist that has a hit song with the perfect lie at the title, is that people are good. Paul is saying that the problem of corruption and sin is not tangent to human nature. It does not align. For all math friends, I use a math term there for you. (coughs) Rather, it penetrates to the very core, rendering us in a state of spiritual death. The problem is not that the fallen man lacks will or free will, as we say today, The problem is, is that he has no desire for God. In our free will, in our brokenness, we will never choose God. Our freedom in our will is to choose destruction and sin. It's never to choose Christ in his righteousness. The desires of man's heart in his natural unregenerate state are, as as God said in Genesis, only evil continually Genesis 6, 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This does not mean that man is as wicked as he could possibly be. And I think that this is where that slider scale that we apply to morality, I think this is where the confusion lies sometimes is that we see people who we know don't know the Lord, but they live a pretty moral life, right? It's really bad in Texas, in in the Bible Belt, right? They were raised to say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and they even know things about God. They're the first ones that will open the door for, for an elderly woman if she comes in. They do all the good things, but they know nothing about the grace of God. And so for that, we have this sliding scale of like, that guy's pretty nice. He's pretty good. And it's deception. It's deception, though, that lies in ourselves at times. And it's deception and perhaps excuse that you've made for a friend or a family member who you know has not trusted in Jesus We say things like, they're a pretty good person. They work hard, right? They provide for their family. They do good things for society. They're not totally evil. It means that sin has such a hold on us in our natural state that we will never have a desire for Christ. Never. And this is why your, deb- your debate with you, your unbelieving coworkers, sometimes is completely fruitless and leaves you discouraged. Because in their, in their will, they want nothing to do with God. It's a really important note here. Nature here that, that Paul speaks of does not refer to man as he was originally created. Remember that. But refers to the fallen character of man. Church, there will come a day when we are walking in our true nature, and our true nature is when we are walking side by side with our Lord. It is the day when the new heavens and the new earth come that we are truly in our nature. Only now is just a broken shadow of what our true nature actually is. But the problem is, under the influence of a humanistic society, people have a notion that We are born in some state of innocence with no basis or no inclination in our hearts for good or evil. Church, you must hear me. This is not the case and it's not biblical. We are born broken. We are born in sin. We are born opposed to God. And that is why in our very nature, we are are exposed to to the wrath of God. Our sin separates us from God. But, and there is only one hope, and that hope lies in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, 
All right. The heavy weight, we're passing it, right? Verse 4 is one of the, two of the most beautiful words in Scripture, right? But God. Say that with me. But God. Say it loud. But God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what? Made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. But God. (coughs) The heart of our theology is found here in verse 4. Historically speaking, the Latin slogan that became the banner for the Reformation, right? Solo gratia was what? By grace alone. What would happen if we took this letter and blotted out every reference of grace that Paul gives? What would that look like? At the very core of Paul's teaching to the Ephesians is the concept of grace. And this is something hard for us. I think more more hard for us in the Western civilization to understand is grace is something we do not deserve. We don't deserve it. Paul proclaims, though, but God. He doesn't say, but man, through his own efforts, or as I grew up in a military family, I was taught, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you can get through, right? That's That's how the American... This American dream and the idea has come in, it's interwoven itself in what our true theology is. And it's only becoming more humanistic as we go. Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you can do it through your own efforts. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Or he doesn't say, but man inclined his heart and his will to the things of God and came to faith. That's not what Paul says. He says, but God being rich in mercy, his divine bottomless grace. Keep going there. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Many people, even Christians, believe that man must make the first step out of spiritual death into spiritual life. Many people believe that. Yet Paul makes it clear that the work of our diving, our, the quickening, or the divine resuscitation, because remember the, remember the story of the guy reaching for the life raft. The reason that that story is not true or a good illustration is because the truth is, is that we were not drowning. We were laying at the bottom of the ocean dead. There was nothing, no way for us to resuscitate ourselves. Divine resuscitation, the quickening of the Holy Spirit, is only made possible through the work of the Holy Spirit. God raises from the dead. When we are no more able to, we are no more able to raise ourselves from the dead than Lazarus was. Regeneration logically comes before faith. It comes before anything we can do. Yes, we believe. Yes, we respond. Yes, we choose Christ. And hear me say that. Like, that's really important. I do believe that we have a role in it. We only have a role in it once we're resuscitated. Once we're given the gift of faith, can we actually believe? Yet it is not until God and the Holy Spirit first changes our souls and resuscitates us from the grave of the spiritual death that we do so. Regeneration happens first, and it's only a work of God. Paul reminds his readers that they have been quickened, but this same Holy Spirit who sealed them and who was given the guarantee of the spiritual inheritance, remember this, we talked about this all in chapter 1, all of these gifts, all of these promises in him, in him you have obtained inheritance. In him you have been predestined. In him you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Paul is reminding us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the power we begin in in our walk with Christ. It is the power with which we receive 
a spiritual life. It's vitally important text to describe the work of the Holy Spirit that we call this regeneration. In the words of Jesus, we speak of, he speaks often of the rebirth or what it means to be born again by which we are brought from spiritually dead to spiritually alive, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away. The new has come. Dead to alive, not sick to better. Dead to alive, old to new. But it is also a supernatural work. You know, I was thinking about that. I've been going through these membership classes, and I've had the opportunity to hear different people that are joining the church's testimony. And what's miraculous about me, every time I hear one of, our, one of the saints share their story, is it doesn't matter if you were saved at age 7 or, like myself, from drug abuse and alcoholism at age 22. Both were a complete miracle because we were dead and now we're alive. Hallelujah. Verse 5, even when you were dead and your, your trespasses made alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. How could it be anything else but by grace if we are utterly dependent on the supernatural work of regeneration to make us alive in the first place? Dead people don't earn the gift of grace. God does it all. This is an important reminder for some of you in the room that are perfectionist. You can't be perfect. Like you can't be perfect as a mom. You can't be perfect as a, as a wife, as a husband. You cannot be perfect. But you know what? In him you are his righteousness. In him. You can't do it on your own. Grace literally means, the word grace literally means unmerited favor. How beautiful is that? Unmerited favor. We have not been saved because we deserve it or we earned it. We haven't been saved because we have worked hard to achieve it. We have been saved by his grace. Let's land this ship. Verses 6 and 7. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. Listen to this, church. So that in the coming ages he might show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You mean to tell me there's more? His grace, his salvation, you mean to tell me there's more? There's more, church. There's more to come. When Paul writes here that Christ is seated, he means that Jesus is on his throne and has dominion over all things. Remember, we talked about that last week. All He feels all in all, right? But here Paul is stressing that believers, including you and I, if you are a child of God, if you're regenerated, if you're born again, those who have been united in Christ through a spiritual resurrection have been given dominion over the world. This is the role of the church. This is where the church comes into play in this. Of course, of course the, rule, not on, the rule that we speak of is not in their own right, but because they are co-heirs with Christ. The church is a co-heir with Christ. Think about that. One way we're involved in this dominion is through prayer. When, they make, when we make petitions to him concerning different areas, but always Christ and not believers have the final say. This beautiful involvement in the heavenly places, hear me on this, is still in its beginning stages. As beautiful as you see it as now, it becomes more beautiful. Our walk with him our walk into the kingdom of God becomes more beautiful because the reign of Christ and his people, his church is eternal. It will last forever. 
God will show or put on display in the coming ages how glorious and rich the inheritance of Christ actually is. And guess what? He has already begun this work. His kingdom has already come. We live today in the gospel age of his work. This will last until the day that the heavens split open and he returns for us. What a glorious day that will be. And at that point, God will reveal other glories, which will be the, the, new, king, the new heaven and the new earth. Church, it's vitally important that we walk in the truth of the Apostle Paul, that he writes to the church at Ephesus today. As his church, we must understand and live in the truth of the word. This includes that the truth of our spiritual stage when we were born. Understanding and living in this truth will help you as you proclaim his name. As you make Jesus not ignorable, you're proclaiming that God raises the dead. I hope that through this truth today that you are reminded of the grace that he has granted you. That while we were dead in our trespasses and sin, Christ has made us alive in him. It, it honestly blows me away that when we think about that, when, when we're up here singing while well, all of us are not just like hands up in the air and just yelling to the top of our lungs because that's how much praise he is due. That is the level of excitement that he is due. I wonder sometimes when we worship compared to the way that we cheered on San Francisco versus Green Bay last night, was our excitement the same? Was our excitement to a football game equal to what it is when we sing praises to our king who raised us from the dead. That hurts, don't it? Because I know these Packer fans over here on the front row. Like, <laughs> We don't. Like We give our praise to so many other things in this world. But we serve a God who raised us from the dead. What more do we have to celebrate, church? It's vital that we remember and give him praise for this truth. But God. Let me...